I've been listening to some of Ray Stevens' classic hits for as long as I can remember. And I've listened to them once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It, another Connor Takeover. You don't have to sing the theme song. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another episode of the Spin It Podcast. Today, I'm your host, Connor, and with me, my co-host, James. Hi. You know, I don't like that you call it a takeover, because really, it's more of a give-over. Oh, no, I take. I fought tooth and nail, hard-fought victories to earn these episodes. (laughs) It's true. Yeah, we've ditched the punch card system of of days of old for a more modern system of, we just kind of do whatever we want. When we feel like it. Yeah. (laughs) But we created the rule book and then threw it out the window. Yeah. At the end of year one, you brought Michael Buble to the podcast. Sure did. Pretty good album. Just narrowly missed my top 100. And because of that... And began the year of of vengeance. A year of vengeance. You vowed for a year of vengeance. So, I mean, we're coming up on the end of year two of the podcast. and, And so I'm inclined to believe this is the last episode of your picks that's a part of the year of vengeance. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. (laughs) Thought this would be a good way to round out not only my year of vengeance, but also, I think, give the audience a more deep view into into my musical tastes that they haven't gotten before. Yeah. Well, they've maybe gotten it a little with uh, the Christmas one that I forced you to do. Yeah, Dr. Demento's greatest Christmas novelty CD of all time. Yeah, you see, this is why I call them takeovers, because they're not ones you would ever pick. That's true. (laughs) No, you're right. I know some Ray Stevens, though. Yeah, because of me. I haven't ever listen to a full Ray Stevens album. But yes, you've introduced me to a handful of singles. And also, don't flatter yourself. I knew some before you were... Uh, before what? Before you recommended them to me. I was going to say before you were around, but that's <laughs> not true. Fair enough. But yeah, Ray, Ray Stevens... Big part of my childhood, big part of my adulthood. That's all your hoods. A big part of my hood. Yeah, he's a big part of my hood. What a guy. Ray Stevens, I think you just earned the hood award. <laughs> hood. Well, Ray Stevens has been a pretty negligible part of my hoods. So, mm. I mean, we grew up in the same place. So I don't know I don't know what part of your hood he's been in, but he missed mine. Yeah, let me let me tell you all about it. Well, well tell me all about the episode, because we're not doing a Ray Stevens album. Oh, 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 right. this is a bit of a weird episode. You know how I like to bend the rules of the podcast. Bend. I, every rule book I can find, I chuck out the window. And so I figured to round out the vengeance here, why not chuck the format out the window too? Sure. <laughs> so instead of an album, what are we doing? We're doing what I have dubbed career classics. Right. So like greatest hits, but... No. Uh, but different. But different. Basically, I've selected a sizable handful of songs that... Si- sizable. Just brace yourself. This is a B-side episode. Yeah, this is a B-side by the way uh, so there will be a lot that ends up exclusively on the b-side episode on spinitpod.com but there's a sizable i i sat and listened yesterday to ray stevens for you for an hour and 40 minutes good yep your vengeance you regret not putting michael buble in the top 100 yet that don't pretend that would have prevented this <laughs> so how are we progressing here so, so i've kind of i've kind of broken the songs up into three categories that kind of uh, also kind of follow the path of his career. It's comedy songs. Hilarious. Serious songs. Not hilarious. And Connor favorites. Debatable. Yeah. <laughs> and so and that kind of follows his career because he started kind of as a comedy singer, songwriter. Then he got more into the serious stuff and then he went back to comedy. He's had a very wide net career, I guess. Oh, he's had some, yeah, wild career doesn't even begin to cover it. What a fella. And so, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah. And as I listen to each one of these groups of songs my opinions on the other groups changed as i was progressing through so we'll talk about it we'll get into it that's yeah i'm really excited to see how you felt about it because again like you said you were a little familiar i've shown you some of my personal favorite songs of his you have one of his albums i do on vinyl but i don't think you were really familiar at all as far as i'm aware with his serious side i'm interested to see your opinions on the songs i selected Uh uh-huh yeah i'm interested to give them and i'm also really excited for you to go up against the mixtaper and factor spin again yeah bringing home another win for us right yeah maybe yeah maybe me. He's been slowly gaining the upper hand on you. That's why you're excited because I'm undefeated. Well, I, every other time you've played 
against the mixtaper, with the exception of our Dr. Demento episode, you swept him. I mean, more or less. You just just wrecked him. So the Dr. Demento episode was a big step forward because he got 50-50 on you. And he texted me. He seems pretty confident this week, but we're going to have to see what he's got planned. Oh, does he now? <laughs> well, I don't know if he is or not. You know him. He's His hubris will be his ultimate undoing. <laughs> he's been avoiding me all day, hiding in the untrue. Yeah. I think it, just psyching himself up. But before we get to him... Yeah, before we get to him, I have a little baby bits of information. Some stuff that maybe won't come up in the songs, but most of the information I'm saving for when we get into the songs, because it makes more sense just to talk about the awards. To talk about the career as we move through the career classics. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, just some very basic baby information. Okay. <laughs> little, nu- little baby nuggets of info. Nuggets of Steve. Some nuggets of tea. Yeah, nuggets of Steve. I like that. The nuggets of teas. Harold Ray Ragsdale, a.k.a. Ray Stevens. He's an American country and pop singer, songwriter, and comedian. Mm-hmm. He was born in 1939 in Clarkdale, Georgia. I have a question. Do you know why he changed his name? Got a stage name? Uh, Ray Stevens? Probably for the reason a lot of people do stage names. It's just catchier and easier for people to remember. Stuff like that. True. As far as I'm aware. I mean, who's going to want to buy an album by Harold Ragsdale? Ray Stevens is much catchier. Ragsdale's a great. I mean, that makes me think of like Rag time music i would be in on that because yeah ragtime music is exactly what he does well yeah (laughs) okay carry on he formed his first band in high school called the barons which were a rhythm and blues group which means you're no longer allowed to accuse me of not liking the blues no no you proved yourself in the zz top episode (laughs) i think you can come around okay yeah he went to georgia state university as a music major pretty cool he got his career started at 18 when he signed with Capitol records prep records division in 1957 at 18 like that that's before he even did his music major, I would wager. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why he was part of the prep records division, where it's like they kind of give you some singles to do and kind of test you. You know, they think you have promise, but they're mm. not signing you to like a full record deal sort of thing. Right. They're like, here, record this song, try this. And they put it out there to see if you gain any traction. His career really took off, though, in the 1960s after he signed with Mercury Records. And then just a couple kind of overarching things. He has released 50 studio albums. 50? That's so many. How'd you narrow it down to... Almost that many songs. <laughs> <laughs> no, like half that many songs. But let's say the next bit here. How many singles has he put out? He's put out 125 singles. Yeah, and so you picked more than one-fifth of those, just for the record. <laughs> Just want to point out the numbers. 67 compilation albums, three live albums, three box sets, two number one singles, and one extended play. Nice. That's a lot of work. That's a pretty good body of work. Yeah. He's had some really interesting side projects as well. Oh, I'll say. He's had his own reality TV series uh, that ended its TV run in 2014, but then kind of had another run like on a streaming platform or something. He had an autobiography memoir that he wrote in 2014. 14, a 30 minute weekly music variety show in 2015, and he started his own cabaret in a showroom in Nashville in 2018 that's still open to this day. Yeah. That I, we almost saw. <laughs> yeah. When Connor was in Nashville for the Elton John concert that we talked about on episode 70 and that B side, we had tickets to go see the cabaret. I knew Connor loved Ray Stevens. I said, Give me 60 bucks, I'll surprise you. Don't worry about it. And I bought the tickets. And boy, was I surprised. Boy, was he surprised when i said we're gonna go see ray stevens tomorrow and he was like oh that's amazing and then ray stevens had a mild case of covid and canceled the show which was the right thing to do on his part but also we just had to take a refund and miss the show really sad yeah i'm hoping to get back down there well maybe now we'll have new we'll be reinvigorated after this episode yeah i I, that's what i'm thinking i think this episode gives us purpose (laughs) sure (laughs) whatever you say and i just meant that in a general sense nothing to do with going to see ray stevens not like greater life purpose but but like just a reason to go see Ray Stevens. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I think that's uh, that's all the little baby nuggets of Steve, as you call it, that I have. Okay. Like I said, pretty expansive career. He's kind of one of the juggernauts in the comedy uh, genre. Yeah. And so I felt it would be good to do more of a career overview than pick any one singular album that's only going to have one or two super popular songs. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. I would bet, I, I don't know for sure, but I would bet his music is a lot of the kind of stuff Dr. Demento would play. I would be almost certain that some Ray Stevens has appeared on Dr. Demento's radio shows. Probably. So yeah, uh, that's all I'm going to have for this. I think it's time we just jump right on into the mixtaper. Wow. Feels like an early start, but okay. Yeah. 
I'll uh, I'll let you get to it. I want to wish you good luck. Thank you. Yeah, have fun out there. I'm going to choose to say I don't need it. Bold. Okay. I like that confidence. <laughs> I figure it'll either be really funny when it holds true or even funnier when it doesn't. Yep. Okay, well, take it away. Mixtaper, get on in here. Hey, it's me, the Mixtaper, back again for another round of Factor Spin against Connor. They're few and far between, but boy, I have really been looking forward to this one for a long time. 20-some episodes. Is that why you've been avoiding me all day? Yeah. I didn't want to spoil anything. I didn't want to give anything away, and I didn't want to... I was in the zone. Fair enough. Zone me with your first supposedly true fact. Okay, well, so here's the deal. This is a B-side. We usually do some extra facts on the B-side episodes. Yep, yep. I was so excited for this episode. We have, I mean, a full, we, we're doing a double classic four. Whoa, that's a lot. I've also come up with some revolutionary new ideas for Factor Spin. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I regret my earlier statement. And well, so I'm going to implement my new ideas in the normal episode. To test them out on me, that way then you'll be ready to use them against James in the future. It I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if he can handle them. <laughs> yeah. But I think you'll want, after we finish this first set of four, you'll probably want to do a normal round of factor spin. Or I will, depending on how well you do. So. Oh. Yeah. But um, you, you call this episode Career Classics. Okay. I'm calling my factor spin Ray Stevens Classic Careers. Oh. Yeah. I wanted to shed light on a bunch of other successful careers and hobbies that Ray Stevens has had. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because it's been quite a lot. I was thrilled when you didn't mention really any of what I'm about to tell you in your little nuggets of Steve. You you cut back on those, and that may have been your undoing. Uh, okay. I'm also worried because you might know a lot about Ray Stevens. So most of these might not even surprise you. But the first of... Oh, do you want to pick a number for, for the facts thing like I've done in the past? Oh, man, I knew you were going to do this to me. All right, so I'd pick number through eight or through... Four. No, one through four. Four. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let's start with four. Too bad. I'm starting with number one. Oh, okay. The first of Ray Stevens' classic careers is he is a retired judoka. Excuse me? He's a retired judoka. Judoka? I don't even, I don't even know what it is, so start there. Right. So you know judo, martial art created in 19th century Japan, judo. Yeah. A judoka oh, okay. is someone who practices judo. It's like a master? Yeah. Well, not even necessarily a master, but he's pretty good. Okay. Was before he retired. I guess my very next question before we dig any deeper into this, we're talking about Ray Stevens, the singer songwriter slash comedian, and not a different Ray Stevens. We're talking about Ray Stevens. That's not what I asked. <laughs> we're talking about Ray Stevens. I asked we're talking about the singer songwriter. Yes, he sings. Sings, he songwrites as Ray Stevens. And this is the, but that same St Ray Stevens that sings and songwrites is a retired judoka. That's what you're telling me? Yes. Okay. When did he retire? Great question. Uh, he retired shortly after 2017. Oh, wow. So he's been doing, he was getting up there in age then. He was. Okay. And when did he start this? That's another good question. It is. Yeah. He started learning judo when he was 10 years old. And within hmm. six years, right around the time he'd be getting his driver's license, you know, going through that driver's education, he had already earned his black belt. <laughs> I see. Did he, uh, was he good? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he won some gold medals in his weight category that he's quite proud of, and he loved it. And he did this alongside having a successful music career. Yeah, it's judo. It's like a hobby. You don't have to, like, uh -huh. it's not a full-time job. How, uh, okay, so, like, how much did he do this while having his music career? Well, about as much to be a full-time job. He did it a lot. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, since he earned his black belt so young... He continued to rank up, understandable, since he spent his lifetime doing it. Mm -hmm. He actually, in 2015, earned his seventh Dan, or Don, which, to my understanding, is like a black belt rank up. So he's leveled up a few times. Any other information I should know? You might like to know that I found some videos of him from back in the day of him flipping people around, and it's quite impressive. And you might also like to know, he's even attached his name to a judo studio. Oh, really? Yeah, the Ray Stevens Academy has been operating since 2017 when he retired. Mm, I like this. Feels like the kind of thing Ray Stevens would do. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to ask one more time. This is Ray Stevens. The, same, the episode's about Ray Stevens. This is Ray Stevens' mm -hmm. classic careers. This uh, We're talking about the same Ray Stevens. Talking about the same? So, so, so the Ray Stevens that performed the haircut song did all this judo stuff yes are you going to be this difficult 
I'm just, I'm just really clarifying that you're not trying to pull a sneaky one on me. I'm skeptical. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. If it's the same person, I'm going to go with spin. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said he sounded like he'd do it. I, I agree. It does. I just don't know. I guess I was more thrown when you said he did this pretty heavily on top of his music career. I don't see that being very feasible. Well, buckle up, because this is his classic careers. The dude's been busy. It's true. So you're locking in spin. Yes. The Ray Stevens, the singer-songwriter, did not do judo. Okay. Well, great. You've locked in spin, and now we're going to move on to fact number two. Wait, no. Oh, no, yeah. wait, what? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Since uh, I'm telling you about several of Ray Stevens' careers, and since information is my most valuable tool, I'll tell you how many you got right at the end. Well, I guess, no, that does kind of make sense, because if that one is true, then I'm like, well, how could he also do this other thing? Then you're going to have a hard, you already had a hard time believing that one. Yeah. Right, exactly. I get it. Okay. I'll, I'll let this one pass. That's my big twist. Okay. Yeah. All right, what's his next supposedly true career? Well, his next career, you may actually choose to believe he was briefly the lead singer of a popular band. Do you think he had time for that on top of his music career? <laughs> it depends which band. Oh my gosh. That's a great question. Do you have any guesses? Uh, The Monkees? <laughs> no. Well, no. Ray Stevens was not briefly the lead singer of The Monkees. I'll give you a hint, though. It is a band known for their goofy songs and pretty eclectic style. He kind of fit the bill. Hmm. I'm talking about the village people. Oh! Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, wait, did you say the lead? Yeah, he, he was the lead singer for the village people. Oh, wow. Uh, the village people, if the name rings a bell, but you're not quite sure, that's the band behind fun, lighthearted hits like YMCA, Macho Man, in the Navy. You know, they've become pretty well known. There's no chance you don't know the YMCA dance. And now the village people were known for like being dressed up in like costumes or characters. Or they sure were. So what was Ray Stevens persona? Yeah, well, you're right. They always had their distinct costumes. There was a cowboy, a biker, a Native American one was a construction worker. One of the costumes that they had was a cop and that's the role that Ray Stevens stepped into. Ah, surprised you didn't go with that as the fact is he was a cop since, you know, you like to do that to James. Ray Stevens was a law enforcement officer. <laughs> <laughs> really blew that opportunity. I guess I did. I, I do feel like I'm blowing a lot of this. Don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Leave me be. <laughs> Yeah, again, this feels like something he could have done. I feel like that's something that I would have known about. I know, I know. It feels like it would be. And so for that reason and that reason alone, I'm also going with spin. <laughs> that reason alone? Yeah, I have confidence in myself. I'm betting on myself here. Well, all right, fine. Well, let's not lock that in just yet. I'm going to tell you all the other things I know. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Village People had a lot of people rotating in and out of the lineup. Between 1977 and today, they've had 24 different members. Ray Stevens took the place of Miles J, who left in 1984 to pursue a solo career. And uh, Ray Stevens stepped in in 1984. He was only with the band for one year, and he left in 1985. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think I'm still sticking with spin. Okay, lock it in. Ray Stevens, the singer-songwriter that we are doing an episode on, it was not a lead singer of The Village People. Locked in. Great. Number three, you'll, you'll learn, once again, you'll learn at the end. <laughs> I'm scared. Ray Stevens was a badminton player. Oh, man, they're getting less and less wild. Like, it's, I feel like judo, a full judo career was a hard sell. But now you're just getting into, I guess I don't know where this is going, but it sounds like you're getting more into hobbies. I've told you, their careers <laughs> and hobbies. Judo was more of a hobby, too. He didn't have a career in judo. No, he had his own, you're talking about attaching his name to a studio. I don't know. All right, tell me about badminton. Talking about the sport, I assume. I am, yeah, the, the badminton with the, with the shuttlecock and the racket. When did he start this? Boy, I couldn't figure out when he started but he started when he was young just another instance where he really loved the sport okay and was he good at this one he was great at judo was he good at this one <laughs> yeah he was pretty good he was pretty darn good at badminton oh, okay <laughs> i see <laughs> yeah so darn good in fact that he did earn a bronze medal in the men's doubles world championship in 1977, the very first year that the International Badminton Foundation hosted the World Championship. Interesting. Yeah, so he got in on the ground floor of, of like, world champions. It's before people really knew what was good. So you're saying he was at the World Champions? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Along with his partner, Mike Tredgett. That just registered. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> I guess it broke my brain. <laughs> you didn't believe that he earned a judo black belt before he turned 18 and started his music career. But you did, you did not react very big when I said he was was a world champion badminton player. Well, not world champion, you know. It broke my brain. It did. Did he do this alongside his music career as well? Or because 
he didn't like win he gave up no this was just kind of a a thing he really only went to the world championships in the 70s 1977 like that interesting the problem i have with this one the 70s is one of his most active decades in terms of like hit songs yeah you can write songs anywhere you can write a song on the sidelines of a badminton court just for the record it's not illegal yeah but i don't think he did (laughs) you don't have to think he did i'm gonna say the writer of everything is beautiful did not go to the badminton championship this is also a spin okay i think you're full of it mixtaper i can tell you really are not taking many facts on these well We'll do another soft lock on that, and let me tell you what else I know. He was a great sportsman, you know, really good sportsmanship. He also played in the men's singles tournament, and pretty early on, he was up against a guy from Denmark named Fleming Delfs, and Delfs ran out the clock and got disqualified on a technicality. Ray couldn't bear it, being the good guy that he is, he went over and pleaded with the refs to give Fleming a second chance and to have him requalified. And it took some persuasion, but the refs agreed, and the tournament went on. Delfs went on to win the entire tournament. He became the first ever men's singles badminton world champion, all thanks to Ray Stevens. That's pretty cool. It is. But I'm sticking with my answer. Fantastic. And finally, for the uh, normal cut, again, we'll have another normal round of factor spin in the (laughs) B-side. I think you're going to want it. Am I? Yeah. Ray Stevens helped develop something you make use of almost every day. And that is? That's right. The barcode. (laughs) Okay, so Ray Stevens invented the barcode. Co-developed. Ray Stevens helped co-develop a barcode. Mm -hmm. When did he do this? (laughs) When was the barcode invented? Well, the barcode itself is a little older, but this specific kind is called a Code 39 barcode. It uses a different code, different format. And he did this in 1977. I see. The same year he won the badminton bronze medal at the (laughs) men's doubles world championship. I see. Very active year. (laughs) He also put out two albums that year. So pretty active year. I know. He's getting busy. Well, when I tell you he co-developed it, he's really not like... He worked with Dr. David Elias to invent the code. And David Elias is the vice president and eventual CEO, he would go on to be, of the tech company Intermec. Mm. Ray Stevens is kind of just with him, you know? I see. And how did Ray get involved in this line of work? Great question. Uh, Ray knew Dr. Elias for a long time. I tried to find out how they met, but I couldn't come across anything. Anyway, Dr. David's talking with Ray about complications they're having with their existing barcodes. They're talking with Boeing, like the aerospace guys, and they were having trouble using Intermex existing barcodes. And he's lamenting to Ray about this over lunch or dinner or one of their visits. So that night, Ray Stevens goes back to his hotel room and he sketches up a new kind of barcode, this code 39. Okay. Yeah, and you can find an image of his sketches in the chat. But he sketched up this barcode, took it back to the doctor, and he said, oh, this is great. I like what you're doing. He tweaked it. He refined it a little bit. And he said that within weeks, we had an operating code 39 printer and a functioning decoder. So you're telling me Ray Stevens basically worked for Boeing. No. (laughs) No, I'm telling you Ray Stevens was friends with a guy who was the vice president of Intermec who was contracted by Boeing. Okay. And that Ray Stevens had enough knowledge to just create a whole new barcode system for aerospace practical reasons is what you're telling me he didn't sit down and like make the whole thing he just came up with a new concept Mm -hmm. that intermec then tweaked did you look at the Mm -hmm. thing he drew it's really not that involved i see but where did his knowledge of what it would need to be like come from like i wouldn't know where to begin to come up with a new barcode system neither would i that takes some sort of prior knowledge i know he like i said he must have been friends with this dr elias for a long time i see all right any other information before before i lock in an answer (laughs) no uh i don't have any other information about that one although i do oh okay the code 39 barcode is mostly not used anymore it's not the industry standard but it can define 43 different characters i see fascinating it is really i learned a lot i learned a (laughs) lot a lot about a lot of things this week it's so surprising that none of these things were on his wikipedia i know crazy i know i couldn't believe it (laughs) i was shocked all right you ready for my answer (laughs) yeah i yeah i'd like to know all right i'm gonna say that that good old harold ray ragsdale did not invent this barcode this is a four spin okay you've locked in four spins i'm gonna give you the chance uh-huh. no you know what no i won't give you the chance no hey no what no, what are you gonna give me the chance for well, i was gonna give you the chance to go back and change 
up to two of them. Up to two? Now that I've heard them all? Yeah, but I'm going to take it away. Oh, you're going to take that away? Yeah, I don't think... Okay, can I make one prediction on something before you give me the answers? I can't change my vote or whatever, but I'd just like to make a prediction on something, if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't I don't mind. <laughs> I think you're trying to pull a sneaky one here on me, uh, McStaper. Okay. I think you're trying to be a little dastard. Okay, well, maybe. I am always a little dastard. I think you're trying to play a little game where no matter what I answer, you can say that the opposite answer is true. I think you're trying to spin this to be these are all like four separate Ray Stevens that you were able to find on the internet who have done these things and because you're calling this the Ray Stevens career classic whatever you called it classic careers it's just I flipped your thing Cr classic careers uh you're trying to be like if I say false you can be like oh no these are true because they're about Ray Stevens well let me stop you right there and if I say they're true you can be like no no they're not about our Ray Stevens, so they're false. You lose. Let me stop you. Let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. That is not what I had in mind ever, and I have proof of that. Okay. Yeah, that's not what I'm doing. Well, that's that. That was my prediction, and so I am standing by that the Ray Stevens we are doing a podcast episode about these songs we're about to talk about coming up did not do any of these things. Those are my fine. That's my fi final answer. Great. Well, so Ray Steve, let's go back one by one. Ray Stevens is a retired judoka. Yep. That is indeed a fact. I believe that that's a fact. Just not about our guy. <laughs> it's about a different Ray Stevens. <laughs> Okay, here we go. But <laughs> hit me with them. <laughs> but it was it was always gonna be a spin. It was always gonna count as a spin because I wasn't that dastardly that I was gonna. Oh, okay. I overestimated your dastardness. <laughs> you did. Well, I consulted outside judges because I was frankly very confused. I wanted to do this for a long time, and I just wasn't sure whether they'd be facts because they definitely all four of them are very true, and all four of them are very much about other Ray Stevens, <laughs> and they're not about this Ray Stevens. So I think in an alternate state of mind, for lack of a better term, you would have absolutely tried to have been that dastardly. So I'm surprised you're taking it easy on me. <laughs> I'm I'm integris. I have integrity. You're integris. You're an inti you're an integris dastard, right? Isn't that yeah. uh, something we said? That is me. So that's the situation. Yes, there is a Ray Stevens who's a professional badminton player. Yes, there is a Ray <laughs> Stevens who was the lead singer of the Village People. Also, I need to tell you this: the Ray Stevens that's the lead singer of the Village People was on this TV show from the 1980s called Great Space Coaster. I watched like two and a half episodes of it, and it is bizarre. That's it is so wild. Okay. It uses puppets like it's the Muppet Show. Mark Hamill was on it once. Interesting. Anyway, we'll watch. I'll show you later. But add it, yeah, add it to the movie list. So Ray Stevens that developed a barcode was Ray Stevens that worked for Intermec. Uh huh. Ray Stevens was a British badminton player. Really great. Sure, sure. There's also a Ray Stevens that's a professional wrestler. There's a Ray Stevens that's oh. a politician in Wisconsin. And Leona Ray Stevens, and that's kind of what gave me this idea. She is the ex-wife of Charles Manson, who helped. <laughs> take him down and i said well there's no way i can use that but let me find other ray stevens oh that's awesome good old you know spin it legend spin it legend charles manson returned <laughs> in a tangent sort of way so that's why because i knew this would happen darn you i just knew this would happen and so i came up with so earlier after like the second one when you said i think you're gonna want to do the other four that was you really going i want to do the other four i want the other four so we're gonna have a normal round of factors spin in the b-side yeah not hobbies and no it's gonna be way more do you do realize though that means you've crippled yourself and it's impossible for you to win i'm aware you, you your whole goal was actually win for once and you've now made it so you can't win by doing this i know the stakes <laughs> i couldn't resist there's so many cool ray stevens out there all right all right i just i just want to be clear that you've cemented at least a tie i know all right well I guess those of you on the B side, you're sticking around, but everybody else, uh, we're moving on. See you in a moment. Tell me about that career classic album art. Yeah. To be clear, the career classics don't really have an album art. Yep. But if we wanted to talk about one, all except two of these songs are all, that we're going to be talking about are on his box set, which is a cute photo of him resting his head on his hands with a couple wrapped boxes. A set of boxes. Real shiny table. Yes, it is. Anyway. So the first group that we're talking about is what? The comedy songs? Yes. Now we're ready to dive in. Uh, would you like to say it? What am I saying? Oh, the thing. Let's spin it. 
Yeah, now that we're spinning it, I'll remind the listener, we're kind of talking about his career as a whole, some of his classic songs. I kind of broke them up into three categories. Some of his most popular or influential comedy songs, then his most popular slash influential serious songs, and then kind of back into the comedy songs with some of my just personal favorites. That is right. And that felt pretty good, too, because that's kind of how his career went. He started out as a kind of novelty singer and took a more serious streak for a little bit (laughs) streak (laughs) and then got back into novelty songs which is a hard way to go i think i feel like you'd be easier almost to get in on the serious side i mean it was pretty smart and we'll talk about it as we get into it why he did that well maybe that's nowadays he was kind of one of the first in the game and so for the normal cut we're talking about 15 songs five in each of those three sections then for the b-side listeners we've got a couple bonus songs in each of those sections yeah like three to four bonus each section so if you like ray stevens you're gonna get plenty of it on spinitpod.com yeah and if you don't you're still getting plenty of it right here right now <laughs> let's jump in with arguably one of his most popular and significant songs mm-hmm. the streak yeah i was gonna say this has to be his biggest song right of like of all time yeah uh, uh, close. It's his second biggest song of all time really? in terms of popularity. Interesting. Yeah. And it held the title for a really long time. Well, <laughs> it's his most popular to me. <laughs> so this song was released in 1974 as the lead single on his album Boogity Boogity. Yeah, an album that I actually have on vinyl. Which is awesome. It is awesome. I realized I mentioned earlier that I'd never listened to a Ray Stevens album all the way through. And then I thought, no, that's not true. Because I have that one. And I've only listened to it like once or twice. But I picked it up for a couple bucks and and have it. Did you say it was like 25 cents? It might have been less than a couple bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been a quarter or two. This is only one of two songs of his to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100, where it spent three weeks there. That's remarkable. It's also in the top two of his best performing songs on the country charts, reaching number three. And it was also an international success, reaching number one on the UK singles chart, and was the eighth best song of 1972. That is so wild. <laughs> And so I want to spend a lot, I mean, I grew up with this box set, like, basically almost my whole life. I mean, 2006, when the box set came out, was, like, right as I was getting into music in my life. And so Uh this has basically been around since the start. So I want to spend as much of our little bit of time we have for each song hearing what you feel about the song. Yeah, okay, so when we talk about Ray Stevens' career classics, and you talk about novelty songs, we talked about novelty songs before on Dr. Demento's Novelty Christmas CD. And one of my complaints about a lot of those songs is that they sacrifice musicality for the sake of the joke. Mm -hmm. They don't really care what the music is. They borrow bits and pieces from other things. They were really kind of weak musically because they wanted to make the comedy bit. Yeah, Ray Stevens rarely does that, at least for most parts of most of his songs. Rarely. He writes a good chorus. He knows how to like construct a song. I mean, yeah, he went to college for music. He better know how to construct a song. Yeah, and so I think most of the time the music doesn't suffer for the sake of the bit and if anything the bit is strengthened by how good his music is i know that's why i had hopes for this being the novelty album i brought you compared to the dr demento one album in quotation marks (laughs) yeah well the streak is a great song i think of the comedy songs it's probably my favorite just because i mean i hate to spoil it early but we're talking about it right now it's really clever i mean this poor guy and his wife ethel are just haunted (laughs) By the serial streaker. Yeah, it kind of pokes fun of the craze at the time in the 1970s or uh, late 1960s that was streaking. For some reason, that was just the it thing. I mean, when I was reading up about the song, there was like an, this song came out and then like a couple weeks later at like an award ceremony, either like, I don't know, the Grammys or something, one of the hosts streaked across the stage what (laughs) yeah like within like three weeks of this song coming out it's about this guy and his wife ethel who yeah just keep coincidentally ending up in the same place as this streaker and has a really fun twist at the end yeah well yeah ethel really gets into it say it ain't so (laughs) i love the like the backup vocals on this song here he comes there he goes he ain't wearing no clothes that's a perfect line yeah that's a perfect line yeah and i just love the like backup singer vibe it had like it's done in that like traditional i don't know like when you think stereotypical backup singers that's the style it's done in right and it's so funny because the song like subject matter is so irreverent and not classy you know what i mean streaking and stuff and 
it's like taboo mm-hmm. but then it's put in this situation where it sounds like it's this performance like you're like you're at a place watching this song get sung on a stage it's not just yep. i don't know it's it's different and of course i'd be remiss if i didn't mention the slide whistle that happens whenever they, and they call him the streak <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice little touch it is now one thing you're gonna hear me say quite a bit on these comedy song sections is okay. he makes a great chorus the chorus is where he does a lot of the catchy musical melodic work mm-hmm. the verses kind of like musically kind of get hung out to dry mm-hmm. it's really just a chorus and then the verses are r- rhythmically sound spoken in meter right but uh-huh but really they're not sung they're not melodic and yeah you kind of have to strip the music back to, in order to get the story across well it is a novelty song you know what i mean it's like yeah, you gotta in a certain sense it enables him to act the parts better yeah so on some of these songs we'll get into he does voices and other little funny bits along the way so oh he sure does i mean he kind of does it on this one with his voice for the guy when he's saying don't look at all or the news reporter yeah yeah. When he lowers the tone of his voice, like he acts it out. And so you kind of got to strip the music back a little bit. But I could get that complaint from looking at it from a purely a song standpoint. I think it, I mean, yeah, conveys the message of the song better, but it does make a lot of these songs significantly less listenable, if that makes sense. Mm. It just kind of pulls you out of the flow of the song it, to some degree. Again, the rhythmic speaking and the rhyme of it really mm. kind of helps ground you, but it's a lot, a lot of two chord vamps as he acts these little skits out in these songs. I see. But I think it's time to move on to our next, uh, coincidentally also kind of a streak, but more in terms of its speed, the Mississippi Squirrel Revival. Of course, we had to talk about the squirrel song. You know, we got a whole math department dedicated to them. I know. I was going to say, is this about the math department? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is another song I knew beforehand of his. Really? Yeah, I did. The church choir in this song is a nice touch. Yep. Being a song about rodents getting loose during a church service and causing a bit of a, a an uproar. But the church choir really kind of puts you, it does a great job of building that atmosphere. I love the little bum 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 ba dum bum 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 that he puts in the song. Dixieland. <laughs> Just to let you know, yeah. Really set the the tone. Yeah. What do you think of the chorus on this one? Really good. The chorus is really good. It's it's sing-alongable instantly. Yeah. Even more so than the streak, I think. Although the lyrics, I guess, are a little more complicated. I do like it. Yeah. The thing about this song that's so funny is it just seems... It's such a plausible situation to have, like, a kid bring a squirrel into church and let it get out. And everyone starts to freak out. That's normal, like, not maybe normal, but understandable. But then he changes it into this revival aspect where everyone starts dancing and screaming and everyone's having this spiritual experience collectively because of the squirrel, because everyone's reaction to the squirrel gets misconstrued. And that's what makes this one really kind of a cut above and enhances the humor of it. I just, yeah, it's a very catchy chorus. I feel like it ramps up into it really well mm-hmm. at the end of each of the verses. Yeah, it's just very sing-alongable. I like it. This song, so it was 1984 album. He thinks he's Ray Stevens. It hit number 20 on the Hot Country Singles. And this song was kind of what was meant to reestablish him as a novelty singer after his kind of serious phase. Imagine knowing him from his serious work. Like, what if you discovered him during the serious period and then you just, like, picked up his next album and this track's on there? Well, I mean, I don't know if you'd know what to think. Yeah, we'll get into it in a little bit, but his serious streak was kind of late 1970s early 1980s and then about 1984-85 he came back to the novelty world but yeah that's that's the mississippi squirrel revival it sure is i hope that's a thing i never experience I, he does this thing where when he he really sets a tone or sets the stage really well i feel like when he puts you in the world of the song he's really good at putting in very specific details in his lyrics it's true a song that surprised me i guess a little bit i knew it was a popular one of his i just didn't realize how popular until i did a little more research into ray stevens is ahab the arab yeah this one you talked about how ray stevens does voices Uh uh-huh this felt like an excuse for him to just babble i'll I'll be honest (laughs) 
it was another we had some fun instrumentation going on he got to experiment with some different sounds Uh uh-huh and that's cool it's funny because he's talking about him experimenting with different sounds but this could have been the one like first and only sound of ray stevens you knew because this is from his 1837 seconds of humor album in 1962 the first album he ever put out wow yeah and this was good enough to kickstart the career yeah really it hit number five on the billboard hot 100 it's just him babbling i well, there's a great story here what's the story i'm not sure why it's so popular it's not really particularly funny he just likes this girl and sneaks into her tent okay yeah but you got clyde the camel <laughs> okay he doesn't redeem the song for me clyde the camel was okay but i don't know just the the humor of this one yeah, huh? also missed me fair enough we were back to back on songs that kind of fell a little flat dang I don't think this song should be a greatest hit. This was his second ever top 40 hit. Wow. I mean, it's from his first album and the other song we'll talk about later. But yeah. And Clyde the Camel has become a bit of a mascot for Ray Stevens. Clyde had a cameo in one of his other really popular songs that we're not talking about today. Santa Claus is Watching You, where he replaced Rudolph on the sleigh. Oh. Stevens, to this day, still sometimes releases music under Clyde Records, which has a camel shaped logo interesting yeah clyde was kind of a, a big hit with the with the ray stevens fans i think a lot of it just comes from yeah him babbling where he just imitates arabian speech and then just makes up what it stood for <laughs> yeah and camel speech yeah and camel speech <laughs> yeah starts going it's maybe another song that kind of is lost to time maybe yeah just in the sense of like this is 1960s humor this isn't a top 40 hit in 2023 fair enough it's not a long one where he does a lot of talking, so that probably wasn't your thing. Yeah. We did get onto a bit of an upswing, though, uh, with It's Me Again, Margaret. Yeah? A little bit. Oh, good. I'm glad, because I, I feel like It's Me Again, Margaret is one you maybe weren't familiar with. No. Outside the fact that I sing it all the time. That doesn't make <laughs> me familiar with it. It also just means I have no context for what you're singing most of the time. Yeah, I'll go, It's Me Again, Margaret. <laughs> and you're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, eh, you, don't, you don't get it. But now you do. Now I do. This one actually found Ray Stevens singing a verse once. <laughs> it wasn't bad. That was nice. I was like, okay. And it's another strange one. It's another real strange one. That, again, is making fun of just a popular craze at the time, which was just calling random people. Is this a popular craze at the time? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Just, like, call people and harass them randomly. <laughs> well, that's not great. It was, like, a thing people would do. Well, the, th the thing about it is since he sings the verse, he can't sing the chorus. That's what I noticed, too. He did a little switcheroo from the norm and just talked on the chorus. Mm. Not to mention, I mean, we're a couple songs deep at this point. None of these chord structures have been necessarily mind-blowing. I mean, they're novelty songs. I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. This is just what I thought. We're getting through the, the funny songs, and again, my opinions evolved when we hit the serious songs. Fair enough. I just thought I was unimpressed with the chord structures, and also the song structures, because the verses and the choruses, I mean, we pretty much get the same verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Like, that doesn't deviate. Sure. We don't really vary in structure at all. Yeah, novelty songs have a bit of a pattern. It's me again, Margaret is from also from the He Thinks He's Ray Stevens 1984 album that was meant to kind of be really his intro back into the novelty world. I see. So this was there with Mississippi Squirrel Revival. He said, it's me again, novelty world. He, 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 he. <laughs> really? And, yeah, another fun voice he gets to do. He has like three of them. Yeah. And then the twist at the end kind of felt weird. <laughs> out of the blue. Little deus ex machina. Little doesn't doesn't fit the rest of the song. So, so there's kind of two twists at the end. Well, that's true. Right? And the first one's really funny because like the, they've caught him. You're like, all right, what's the rest of the song gonna be why is this song still going they've caught him and then all of a sudden he goes and they gave him one phone call and all of a sudden you're like uh-oh <laughs> no that was good that was great that was great so that one's a good it's a good setup knockdown the stalker got arrested yep one phone call that would have been fine as the final punchline yeah nothing wrong with that i think we took it a step too far and then just at the end there's a little stinger where he does his margaret voice and she pays to get him out mm -hmm. buys the handcuffs yeah a little bit too far it's silly but i said how is this song four minutes long <laughs> <laughs> is, oh. well, 
it's good it's long but also if you kind of just count the end of the song of the song piece before it just goes into into the kind of epilogue it i do love how it ends with the but i'll miss you and he does like the little vocal wobble Mm -hmm. it's a novelty song and he's over here doing like voice wobbles which is actually like an impressive thing (laughs) it's like what are you doing i think the word you're looking for is vibrato yeah the technical term i like voice wiggles it's not even what you said you said voice wobbles wobbles wiggles wiggles wiggle wobble boogity boogity okay but with that it's time to take a little break from the comedy comedy we'll be back yeah don't forget about us and now we're gonna take a little deep dive into his serious streak yeah and this is interesting as we get into the serious stuff this is where i'm really interested because i put these on here you know i separate them out by these sections and then within the sections i kind of organize them in a way that i felt would have the best impact on you and would also be the most interesting to talk about in a specific order i see and so it was kind of deliberate my placement of these songs here well i was confused oh (laughs) yeah let's roll feels like so let's roll is also from the 2004 album thank you Uh uh-huh and is a song specifically written by ray stevens it is an original yes it shows yeah and it's his other response to 9-11 yeah and this one feels like it kind of bridges the gap or walks the line between comedy songs and serious songs really because it's got all the energy of one of his comedy songs well having only heard one other of his serious songs it has all the energy of a comedy song and it's an oddly light-hearted optimistic take on a very serious event yeah i feel like he was going for inspiring inspiring i think he was going for patriotic ins- inspiration for the for the vibe certainly patriotic so a lot of artists including neil young actually have t- songs titled let's roll that are s- around or at least reference the phrase let's roll uttered by todd beamer uh, aboard United Airlines Flight 93 during the 9-11 attack. Yeah. Ray Stevens' take is he's saying that this phrase is now amongst the greats of other phrases said by other patriotic or inspiring people Yeah, who did great things. Yeah, and honestly, I agree. Even though I think a lot of people might not necessarily know the phrase. I, I agree. Or the context of it in the song. I mean, once you start listening to the song, the context becomes apparent. But even then, you're like, oh, this must be a, like a big phrase or something. But even then, you still might not know what exactly it's from if you didn't know the context. Yeah, no, I definitely did look it up just to be sure. And I was kind of surprised that it came out so soon after 9-11. I mean, I guess that's... It just doesn't feel like the tone of most of the songs from that era. Another one I'm interested to hear your take on is the song Nashville from the album of the same name that came out in 1973. Yeah, so I think this is almost the pinnacle of Ray Stevens' music musicality that you showed me from this entire collection phenomenal really phenomenal chord work here actually really cool texture with the horns as well i really love that Mm -hmm. my main thought on this one for a time was why doesn't he just do this on the funny songs like think of how elevated everything would be if he could incorporate a little bit more of the of the fancy chord structure and the music theory that I know he knows. Uh, I just feel like that doesn't fit the novelty. Oh, but he can make it fit. I feel like it just wouldn't. I think he can make it fit. I feel like part of the reason that a novelty song works is because it's just a simple, catchy little one or two chord thing that gets stuck in your head with, and the lyrics are the focus or the story. I just feel like it doesn't work. It, it wouldn't feel like a novelty song if you wrote it this way. Mm, maybe. I also love the horns, though. I love that you pointed that out. Oh, yeah, they're great. This song, actually, it was a lot more recent than I thought it was. Based on, I mean, I associate Ray Stevens mostly with the 70s and 80s, but he's calling out the Tennessee Titans, who weren't even a football team until 1999. So that caught me off guard. I was like, oh. A little pee behind the curtain on that one. You're listening to the box set version that came out in 2004, and Ray Stevens is notorious for re-recording his songs over the decades. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And adding newer references. So the song came out, again, in his 1973 album of the same name. Really? But he has since re-released the song at least one other time, if not multiple times, and he will sometimes update lyrics to keep with the current times. We're talking about it again in a couple songs. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Nashville, I really liked a lot. Yep, I'm glad you liked it. Now, you will remember back when we were talking about The Streak, I said it was one of his two most popular country songs. Yeah. Next up is Misty, the other one. Okay. 
Uh, this is from the 1975 album, also called Misty. It's a cover of the 1954 jazz song by pianist Errol Garner. It was originally an instrumental in the traditional 32 bar format. Lyrics were later added by Johnny Burke and was on yeah. Johnny Mathis's 1959 album Heavenly. However, Ray Stevens then took it and changed it all around, turned it into this upbeat tempo country song. Okay. And yeah, so he basically redid all the uh, the entire arrangement and he did such a good job arranging it. It won him a Grammy for best music arrangement of the year. Interesting. So you're kind of I'm having a, another whiplashy series of moments here and you're telling me all these songs are covers. I didn't look into who wrote them or anything, but yeah. Misty was another song, True Confession Time. Uh-huh. It did pass me by the first time. I did not take any notes as I listened to it because I was just kind of moving through it and then I realized that I had finished the song and I was like, oh shoot. So I did listen to this one twice. It goes by fast. It, go it goes by really fast. <laughs> Two minutes and 43 seconds is quick. And I didn't realize, yeah, he did the arrangement and stuff. I thought it was a really great display of his potential. And I just loved it, you know? It was a really interesting new perspective on Ray Stevens and what he can do. And it made me dislike the first batch of songs a little more. Because I was like, <laughs> why hasn't he done this? They're, they're like so far behind this stuff. Why don't I know this stuff? Why do I know Guitar Zan and not Misty and Nash? What, where's this been, you know? We're on a really strong stretch. You've been sleeping. I guess so. Sitting up with the dead. Yeah. <laughs> Misty and Nashville were two of my favorites from this chunk of songs. We're on a really strong stretch. He took a song that was originally an instrumental that some other guy added lyrics to and then took those lyrics and said, yeah, but I'm going to redo the music. So it's basically a completely different song from what was originally written. It now has lyrics and completely different music. Well, I bet the chord structure is the same and the, it's recognizable, I'm sure. Uh, the chord structure is probably similar. It's just yeah, I'm sure. not played with a banjo traditionally. <laughs> yeah, it's just funny to me. The concept of this other guy's like, yeah, I like your song, but it needs lyrics. And then Ray Steven comes around and like, oh, I like your lyrics. I'm going to change the music. I could do the song better. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so now someone else needs to come back in and redo the lyrics to Ray Stevens' version. Oh, I like it. Ray Stevens' version peaked at number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100 mm. and number three on the Billboard Hot Country Singles. Other notable versions of this song include Count Basie, Aretha Franklin, oh, wow. and Bing Crosby. Definitely not in this style. Yeah. <laughs> I can't picture any of them going at it like this. <laughs> Yeah. And again, it's just a song that goes by so fast. The walk my way and the pluckiness of it in the uh, in the upbeat tempo, it just it flies by. Yeah, it does. A song that doesn't fly by, but in a good way, is Everything is Beautiful. Yeah. Everything is Beautiful is the song that dethroned uh, the streak in Ahab the Arab for being his most popular songs. Actually, I can see it. I can see it. Everything is Beautiful is... Per the numbers, Ray Stevens' most critically acclaimed and popular song. It is a song he actually wrote himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not a cover. It was written and composed by him. It's from the album Everything is Beautiful that came out in 1970. And again, was his first major success as a serious songwriter. I can believe it. It's the only other song other than The Streak to hit number one on the Hot 100. It hit number 39 on the country charts charted internationally and something i just found out was he recently re-recorded the song in 20 he's recorded this on like five different times different versions like like updated you know the quality and stuff you know stuff like that just yeah keeping it relevant with the times he's re-recorded like five times his most recent being in 2020 as a 50th anniversary version that includes a spoken prologue and epilogue noting how much progress has been made in the world since 1970 wow which is really cool. That is cool. That's a neat thing. I can totally understand this song being a chart topper. It's got a great message. It's got that same kind of trademark, plucky, upbeat tone to it. That real patent optimism that Ray Stevens emanates through all of his songs. You know? Mm -hmm. I like it. It's a, it's a feel-good song. It makes me feel good. And it's accomplishing its goal. Again, grew up with the box set. This was a song that I'd make my dad like rewind and play over and over. Definitely a, a favorite on this entire episode for me. Spoiler alert. Mm. <laughs> You should probably alert to the spoilers before you spoil. Then they're no fun. Just in case you didn't realize that was a spoiler. <laughs> also, we talked about Bing Crosby covering some of the other songs that Ray Stevens has covered. Mm -hmm. Bing Crosby covered Ray Stevens with a version of this song. No way. Bing Crosby did a version of this song, which is therefore a cover of Ray Stevens. That's awesome. Yeah. 
And it was also on American Idol season four, apparently in 2005, performed by all the top 10 finalists. Oh, <laughs> well, maybe I had heard it before. Where was I in 2005? Watching American Idol? Maybe. Maybe. Well, I liked it. I think it's a great song. Uh, yeah. And with that, it's time to move into the last section of the song, back into the world of novelty, with just some of my personal favorites of Ray Stevens. Yeah, I had some thoughts about your personal favorites versus <laughs> the comedy songs we started with. Okay. Well, our first one that I'm going to hit you with is a two-parter, The Ballad of the Blue Cyclone Part 1 and 2. Both parts from the 1985 album, I Have Returned. Again, so this is really it was I Have Returned and Thank You that I pulled the most songs from. It's true. This two-parter was even longer than the last two-parter. It <laughs> In excess of eight minutes. Ooh, back to silly songs. And another one where he rambles. Back to rhythmic talking. Arr, 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 arr. Uh, yeah, another babble <laughs> bit. I said you're lucky those middle serious songs were so good because music score <laughs> is, is struggling under the weight of these comedy songs a little bit. Uh. Also, notable to point out, he talks about a wrestler who runs a school where he teaches karate and jujitsu and other martial arts, so I don't think it's that out of line to assume that Ray Stevens had some expertise in that field. Just, I say, for no reason in particular. Well, say, well, why are we bringing this back up? I'm not, no, I just, I'm just saying it. You're on my side, right? Yeah. But yeah, this is a silly song just about a guy who goes to a wrestling ring and gets beat up by a crazy wrestler. <laughs> it's a little long. <laughs> I really like, again, the kind of backup singers, the blue cyclone. That part's good. It feels like almost an old western. Uh-huh. Very dramatic and cinematic. I think the second part of the story helps sell the first part for me a little bit, where he, he's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to go back. And then his buddies abandon him. He just gets beat up again. It's, <laughs> it cracks me up. Do you remember that viral video of the uh, soccer goalie, Scott Sterling, that kept getting kicked in the uh -huh, face yep. time and time again? It's a little bit like an early version of that. Yep. Ballad of the Blue Cyclone was all right. It was an interesting way to kick back into the comedy songs. It's another one that you may not remember, but I've shown you before. Back in in high school i when you, when you drove me home one time i forced you to sit in my driveway and listen to it before i get out of your car for eight minutes <laughs> on a on a <laughs> three minute drive back to your house i sat there for four <laughs> times longer than your drive to listen to the song yeah that sounds about right yep another personal favorite of mine too drunk to fish released in 1997 as a single never really popped up on any albums until this box set as far as i'm aware never go fishing with a man who yeah it's a fun one it's a fun song it's great it's another one that i just really enjoy the story of it's he does a good job at world building and putting you in uh -huh. a particular moment and situation yep which to his credit that's not easy to do and again it's got another really kind of funny twist at the end where he's like looking up at the hill car and he's like hey, lord is that, is that you if if you pass me by tonight i will reform and he's like and from that moment on he never touched another drink of alcohol <laughs> and he's like the lord works in mysterious ways sometimes it's really funny little mini twist yeah as a fan of fishing this was a song my dad would sing when we'd go fishing the thing about it is if you take away the lyrics this song sounds just like all the others there's nothing particularly distinct about it I don't know about all that. Not much from his other comedy songs. I mean, maybe after you've listened to like almost an hour's worth of novelty songs. <laughs> it's true. I was an hour deep at this point. I was I was Ray Stevens to the max. You could start this song and I would know it. I would know it just by its music alone. Well, yeah, that's not to say it's not recognizable. It's just not distinct. It fits Ray Stevens style. Mm hmm. But up next is a song I live by to this day. The haircut song. Yeah, yeah. I agree with the principles of this one. You really do got to know what you're getting when you go to get a haircut. Yep. This is also from his 1985 album, I Have Returned. And it's a whole song about, you know, when you get a haircut, get a barber that you already know because you don't know what kind of haircut you're going to get walking into a random barber shop. Yeah. Each verse kind of has its own silly little joke at the end of it. It does. And most of those jokes involve him having really... <laughs> apparently violent and intimidating barbers <laughs> yeah <laughs> he just feels the need to compulsively lie to them so that they give him a, a decent haircut i uh-huh i mean okay and he says he's a logger and then at the second one he goes i run a church for loggers yeah. it's like the, there's no need to bring the loggers back up but it's really funny no he just keeps building <laughs> onto the lie for no reason i liked it i liked it i yeah. thought this was one of the more solid comedy songs and you'll notice he does sing a lot more of the verses in this one too <laughs> yeah yeah it was 
wasn't nearly as talky, even though it's equally wordy. Probably more wordy. Fair enough. A logger. What an interesting choice. I don't know if I'd know where to begin lying about loggers. <laughs> we log stuff. Yeah, maybe that'd be where I start, and they know right away. He needs to release a new version of it in the modern era, where it's just somebody who's really into, into like data entry, and he's like, I'm a logger. I'm a logger. Okay, taking it a little far. Fills out the logs. Yeah, or maybe he could, uh, maybe he could do one where he's pretending to be a kind of beer, effervescent and light in color and body. Say, I'm a logger. Oh, I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of options here. Ray Stevens, those are for you. If you're listening, those are free. Our next song, Power Tools. Oh yeah. So we mentioned how Osama Yomamu was his first time charting since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. This was the last song to chart in the 90s before that dry spell it hit number 72 on the hot country song charts wow it's from his 1991 album number one with a bullet and let me tell you if you are into two chord vamps and accented yelling power tools is another song for you it's like the guy has one bit i'm not saying it's good or bad and he's very crafty with lyrics but he really sometimes just leans heavy on his one joke that also could just be the fact that again we're pulling 26 songs from <laughs> over 50 years of music You're right and all the ones that people like have that bit in you them. might be right it, it's not a, it's not <laughs> it's a little bit of bias going on here you know and selection bias it's not a random sampling yeah yeah well i like power tools the power bed thing is a great twist at the end it's such a funny twist the, the concept is so funny everyone just wants to play with power tools i didn't hear him because i was playing with my power bed <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Everybody wants to play with power tools. Everybody who's ever held a power tool has absolutely revved it up a couple too many times for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. It just, it's a feel good song. It's funny. I like it. It's another one that has a funny line that always makes me giggle. It's the one where when he does the shouting from the wife bit the first time because he like post drives himself down to the ground so she nicknames him hey shorty and then the second time when he pulls himself up under the deck or whatever she goes hey shorty funny how a nickname sticks <laughs> it's just like that little like insert is really funny you know i also have to mention this is the third song on this episode that mentions a weed whacker i didn't mention either the first two <laughs> but in the mississippi squirrel revival he says it's a bird a plane it's a demon it's a weed eater so he, he kind of talks about it there and then he talks about it again in It's Me Again, Margaret. It's talking about a weed eater and a live chicken. And now he talks about it again, firing up his new gas-powered weed whacker. What does Ray Stevens have this obsession with weed whackers? What, what's up? <laughs> He's got stock in the weed whacker company. This is really Ray Stevens' entire career is just a ploy by Big Weed Whacker to sell more weed whackers. <laughs> I wish I had some weed whacker stock. I guess you could buy some. <laughs> with that, we are moving into final spin territory. That's right. What an exciting final spin it is. <laughs> I'm curious to know your overall thoughts. Should you go first or should I go first? It's already been a long enough episode. Hit me with what you thought. Great. I, I don't know. Maybe I should go first. That way we can end with me being outraged. Here's what you're going to do. All you're going to do is say nine and then say a funny unit. And then <laughs> it's going to be my turn. So just do it. Fair enough. <laughs> Rip the bandaid off. <laughs> Fair enough. He's up there for some of my favorite singer songwriters of all time, even though he's a novelty guy. Because not only does he just have some of my favorite silly songs that make me giggle and make me happy, feel good, you know, feel good songs. But his serious work is just astounding. Surprising. Uh, at least the popular stuff. <laughs> right. So this one gets a 10. What? Okay, no, no. You said you weren't going to get anything at 10. The 10 was for, like, something really special. I can't think of anything more special than a perfectly curated list of my favorite Ray oh, Stevens songs. Oh, no, come on. <laughs> really? The cream of the crop. This is your 10? <laughs> This is my 10. You gotta 10 yeah. what you ask? What what possible unit would go with such an amazing number as a 10? 10 acts of vengeance. Let this be my final act of vengeance on you in the year of vengeance. 10? You, you're putting this above Billy Joel. You're putting this above Elton John? Above Phil Collins and Menace, Barry Manilow? It's a perfectly curated list of my favorite songs from one of my favorite singer-songwriters. That feels so not <laughs> right. Like that genuinely. I don't know how that's sitting with me. Listen, I'm not saying I won't come to regret the decision. I'm just saying I'm writing the high of vengeance right now and it feels amazing. 
<laughs> okay, whatever. Well, that's your score, I, I guess. 10. <laughs> it's been one for the record books. My score, I guess. I'll it's time to figure out how to rebound from that. <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts about this album. Yeah. The comedy songs initially just had me feeling a certain way. You know, they were different. Some of them I already knew, obviously, so I knew what to expect. Mm -hmm. A lot of that first batch didn't impress me. Then we hit the serious songs. Blew me away. I was thoroughly impressed with the serious songs. And they made me think the first songs could have been a little more. Made me wonder what might have been. And then we got to your picks and your batch of songs. And honestly, I don't know if this is just because we had just come off of the serious songs and I had like had a taste of peak what I would consider musical peak Ray Stevens but I actually liked on the whole your group of songs better than the first group of songs I'm not surprised you know why why because I'm the people's champion I know okay. what the people want and you're part of the people the people don't want <laughs> this to have a 10 <laughs> But I, there are some exceptions, like uh, like the streak and score revival. You know, there's some ones that overlap. But for the most part, and if those weren't in the first section because they were, you know, milestones in his career, they would have been in mine anyways. So I'm not I'm not right shocked by that. So what I did was I broke my scores up a little bit. It's got an overall score, and then I also just scored it theoretically if we only did the serious songs or if we only did the silly songs. Okay. So you can figure out if any of these beat your threshold. Overall. All 28 songs, <laughs> B-side included. 26. N no, I'm not discounting your, your part one and part twos. <laughs> music gets a 77. Lyrics get an 80. Pretty good on lyrics, even when the music does a little too much vamping or similar chord structures. Instruments of production gets a 74. It's just the song structure, the sound, the style of a lot of those comedy songs was the same. I'm not surprised by your instrument and production because you were r ripping on the repetitive chord structures and stuff of the of the silly songs. But I am a little sad that music was as low as it was. because I felt like even when he did the repetitive stuff, it was still good and catchy. Yeah, when he sung, half these songs are just choruses. What do you think my music score is going to be? So for the vibe, then, of the overall collection of 28 songs, I had to stoop a little low and give it a 73. It was so long. It was so many songs. And they're so generally homogenous. Like, an hour and 40 minutes is a bit of a slog. So the vibe of listening to this whole collection at once, albeit a career-spanning pseudo-greatest hits playlist, it's a bit of a chore. So the vibe was a little lower. So that's the overall. Serious songs, though. I would bump the music up to an 83. Really enjoyed a lot more of his musicality. He got to show off his theory knowledge, his classical training, like what he actually can do musically on those serious ones lyrically 84 i thought a lot of those lyrics were very strong and, and captivating very intriguing instruments of production 81 he just plays a lot more the bagpipes the horns a lot was going on in those serious songs that i really liked and the overall vibe 81 solid i really enjoyed those and if you just scored the silly songs music dips to a 73 lyrics still pretty strong at a 77 instruments of production down to a 70 and vibe also down to a 70 to put it in perspective, the overall score is a 77.8, which would be number 522, which to your credit scores above Hank Williams and A Tribe Called Quest and some other things that we've covered. Again, mostly for those serious songs, though. Not off to a great start. I'm feeling a, you know, your vengeance on, on the horizon. Uh, no, no. Listen, without those serious songs, uh, it drops. <laughs> significantly to a 74.3 and number 570 just the silly songs would rank at number 570 how many is that from the bottom about 30 and it still puts it above other episodes we've done like america by 30 seconds to mars and mother in this moment mm. but just for the serious songs only considering that group of serious songs 83.7 number 316 which puts it in between janice joplin who is above and rem which is below so close so the best songs on this album would be number 316 all of this album is number 522 what was your threshold i feel like you're undercounting this the, the uh serious songs i feel like you hyped them up way more to be putting them where you're putting them uh when removed from the silly ones so i'm a little disappointed in that i i, I really don't care about your overall or your silly song placement that's about how, what i expected i feel slighted by your placement of the serious songs you don't think almost an 84 
is solid. No, I would have thought upper 80s for most of the scores with maybe instrumentation and production getting a soft 90. Interesting. And that's a little out of my ballpark for that. I mean, I, I just feel like there was some really powerful, serious songs I selected. And they would have gotten out of the lower 80s and up into the upper 80s. Well, some of the individual ones do, I think. But just as a collection, as a non-album centric collection, again, that three song run of Nashville Misty Everything is Beautiful honestly rivals almost any three song run we've had on the podcast. You know what? I'll take that. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. I brought James the best run of three songs we've ever done on the podcast. And if he's willing to say that right now on microphone, we enter a year of healing. I'm doing this for you, audience. <laughs> and also because off the top of my head, I can't remember a ton of the specific three song runs, but it's really, it's a really solid run. I do think it's probably the best three song run that we've had. I'll, I'll stake my claim to that. And that's my spin it award. <laughs> the best three song run goes to me not to ray stevens <laughs> no <laughs> well, he didn't do the run that's true you're the one that ran them you put them in order exactly i did the run yeah and with that the year of vengeance technically not to a close yet because we're not the end of the year but you know with coming the end of the year we will have a little celebration the passing of the torch if you will from year of vengeance into year of healing <laughs> year of healing so look forward to that yeah let's heal let's heal together spin it let's heal it what was your arbitrary threshold what was what would the whole album have had to done before oh the whole album i i didn't really have a, a point for it was really just the serious songs i was curious about you just made that up oh so it's a good thing i scored them separately on my own i'll be honest with what you in the upper 80s with maybe a soft 90 in there i was giving you a 100 placement buffer and normally i said i want you in the top 100 i was gonna give you top 200 top 200 wow okay i was gonna say that's a little more reasonable for it to get to the top 200 at this point it needs to crack 86.5 solidly yeah if it had an upper 80 scores even just a couple of them that might have gotten close so this is probably the hardest question you'll have to answer all night which of these 28 songs are you gonna put on the playlist oh uh... <laughs> so here's the deal i think what we need to do especially with to make sure we encompass you know the classic career this guy has had and also fully encompass what this episode was we need to pick one serious song and one comedy song for the playlist if i were picking two i wouldn't but i can understand that and agree with it i'll be honest i'm setting that almost as a rule for myself because i could very easily just pick a serious song i know you'll pick a serious song and then one with two serious songs but we're doing a guy known for his novelty song he needs to have one yeah we gotta pick one and i kind of think we should do this together yeah well for me in the comedy song camp this may be a surprising pair i think it's got to be the streak or kiss a pig hug a swine that's too fun i kind of like kiss a pig hug a swine oh, is wait hold on hold on we may have to make that an honorary playlist edition it's not on spotify <laughs> Kiss a Pig can't be on the playlist. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's not on Spotify? No. So I think that defaults us to the streak, which... What? Again, I have no problem with. It's Ray Stevens' biggest hit. Second biggest hit. Either way, it's a biggie. I am shocked. How is Kiss a Pig not on Spotify? Well, I don't know, but Ray Stevens still comes up when you search it, so... It's like Spotify knows who the song belongs to. I think the reason I would have taken that over the streak is just because everybody knows the streak already. And Kiss a Pig is a very musical, mm. fun song. But the streak is pretty funny, pretty good all around. Mississippi Score Revival would have also been on my short list. As for serious songs, I don't suppose I'd talk you into Nashville. I don't suppose there's any way I talk you into anything, but everything is beautiful. Oh, you can talk me into a couple, actually. Oh, okay. I've got three of them. Upon further reflection and briefly listening to the other ones, I think I would take, if you're ditching Nashville, I'd probably go with everything is beautiful. That is one of the three acceptable responses. And I like it because the streak and everything is beautiful are the only two songs to ever hit number one on the hot 100 it's true and the street kind of has more of his country flair on it and the other one i was going back and forth between was misty which also mm -hmm. is obviously saturated with country style mm. so i think it's nice to diversify a little bit since he's mostly known as a pop novelty country guy to get a little bit of that serious everything is beautiful flavor so it's a good mix mm -hmm. so everything is beautiful and the streak oh no though i think this was a good episode i had fun this week love it when i take the reins i thought it was a good episode <laughs> and then we hit my score well no well we've had some moments factor spin was was a moment 28 songs was it's been a real a roller coaster for you it's been an episode <laughs> i'm exhausted 
I'm thoroughly, thoroughly drained yeah. at the end of the Ray Stevens career classics, like no other episode before it. I'm more ramped up than I've ever been. That's great. I need a year of healing. <laughs> it's going to take me a year to recover. Let this be a lesson learned. We'll see. Uh, we will see. But till then, you can find more Connor Pick episodes anywhere you listen to podcasts. We we have several of them. Some real great highlight episodes of the podcast. They're fun and unique. I like them because they mix things up a little bit. And most of my picks, I think, have had B-side episodes. Most have. So you can check those out at our website if you're not already there. www.spinitpod.com true and we also have other socials which are i always like this part because i get to quiz you we sure do yeah you know we, we've got a twitter at spin it pod and then an instagram at spin it pod official yep give us those rates and thumbs ups and likes and scores out of 10 and all the other things on whatever platform you're on and send fan facts or spin if you got them yes please send them you can do that to our email oh this is a new one spin uh, yeah, we, but are you going to say it? Do you know it? Yes, I do. I definitely do. I hear you looking for it. Stop. It is definitely the spin it podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. I definitely didn't just pull up my phone and check it. So we're in all those places. It's true. <laughs> Go follow the mixtaper. Hey, uh, mixtaper, you want to come back in and t- plug us with your social? No. Oh, come on. You got to tell people where they can find you. No, I retired. I'm I'm done. You, you retired from the podcast, but you still have Twitter. Yeah. If you want to keep up with my antics in retirement, I guess. It's at the underscore mixtaper on Twitter where I tweet. Where you tweet. Thanks, mixtaper. So you can play at that game. <laughs> well, I know. I know it. <laughs> of course you do. You would never not know your own handle. Yeah. Anyway, this outro really rambling on. It's the perfect way to end a 28 track episode. Yeah, uh, If you made it this far, I'm both a little sorry and impressed. I'm mostly afraid. And as always, keep, keep spinning. spinning. Did you know Ray Stevens is stalking me? I had the same thought, that it was just a raccoon. Well, good to know.